Nutre y pues les dejo para que se introduzcan ellos solos. Or I can, oh, hey, excellent, excellent. Hi, everyone, I'm Ilya, this is Dan. We're uh, two of the four co-founders of Diaspora. We um, love to thank you for coming. You guys are awesome. Thank you, everyone who is doing awesome stuff, the organizers. We're having an excellent time. Um, yeah, but Dan can talk a little bit about who we are. Yeah, so just to give you guys a, a disclaimer, um, how this presentation is going to go, it's going to... We're going to kind of just describe who we are and um, everything's okay. I think everything's okay. We're going <laughs> to describe like who we are, you know, we're an open source project and kind of go into, you know, what diaspora means for people. And then we're going to get a little technical because like we wrote this thing recently, which is like, we think it's totally badass and we want to tell all you guys about it. So it might get a little technical just as a disclaimer. But don't be scared because that'll be at the end. Yeah, and please like feel free to ask questions if things get confusing because yeah. it's like a little out there. But um, okay, so who is Diaspora? Well, uh, as Ilya mentioned, we're two, right? We're two co-founders, but uh, there are four of us. That's us working uh, in San Francisco. Uh, so us as Diaspora Inc, we're four guys, uh, we're all from NYU, that's how we met. We met through the computer science department, Courant, um, and we all kind of came together, um, you know, during February of 2010. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the guy, but Evan Moglin came and gave a talk at NYU about, uh, you know, privacy in the cloud. Uh, for, for, you, for you guys who don't know who Evan is, he's Richard Salman's lawyer. Um, what else is he? He's also the general counsel for the Free Software Foundation. So he's like extremely eloquent and his talk was totally awesome. It was entitled Freedom in the Cloud. And his takeaway was, you know, we as individuals are, you know, sacrificing our digital, dig digital freedoms for just like basically the sake of convenience, right? Like we'll use Gmail or Facebook to connect with people, but um, you know we're actually giving up a lot of privacy um, as a side effect, right? And that kind of sucks, right? And he was talking to a bunch of uh, computer scientists at NYU, and he was saying, you know, what's even worse is like even us as nerds don't have an alternative to these services, right? We nerds still use these like cloud computing totally privacy bashing services and he was he was basically like look we can do better than that as computer engineers so you know the four of us kind of meditated on his talk and a week or two later we were just like all right that sounds like fun like let's try to make the alternative um, so um, so yeah that's kind of how diaspora got started um, We've been working on Diaspora since, I guess, June 2010. Um, we work out of San Francisco. Um, we're hosted out of Pivotal Labs. For you guys uh, who don't know what Pivotal Labs is, they're an elite software consultancy shop. They specialize in like Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Uh, they do, they've done a lot of work with like Twitter and Google and you know the whole bunch. And uh, they've been nice enough to basically donate two desks and two monitors to us. Um, so they've been hosting us, giving us free breakfast. So I just want to give a shout out to uh, Rob Me. He's the the CEO. So like, thank you so much for hosting us. Uh, so we've been working out of there ever since. Um, but Diaspora is really like a lot more than just the four of us up there. Um, we have a blossoming open source community. We are open source. That's why like we're talking here. Um, so. To give you guys a little grounding, uh, there's this software consultancy shop in Massachusetts, and they kind of audit uh, open source projects, and they've labeled us in the top 2% of all open source projects ever. And we haven't even been open source for a year yet, uh, which is totally awesome. Uh, and they've kind of came to this conclusion uh, based on aggregating a bunch of different stats, like page views, lines of code, like uh, unique contributors, and all that stuff. So that's pretty awesome. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be watching this out of the corner of my eye. This is like, sorry. Anyway, but 
Diaspora is more than just us. So as, as Dan was saying, we're, we're a blossoming international community with, and, and these are at least some, not all, of course, of the people that make it happen. We have 10 people in the open source core team. This is just developers. Uh, we have 100 unique contributors that contributed code. Way more people have contributed translations, design mockups, all sorts of other things. Um, as far as, uh, there's 450 or 4,500 watchers, at least on GitHub. Th those are developers, but there's way more interest in sort of a larger, not only technical communities. Um, I just wanted to sort of briefly run down and talk a little bit about people and what do they do. So Mr. ZYX, whose avatar is over there, John Haas, um, he manages all of our more than 45 translations, which is just like a ridiculous, phenomenal thing that would have taken us way more time than any of us. Um, so it took Rafi a day, a week, to do that previously. Um, he also wrote the like feature. And he's super active in IRC and the dev mailing lists and all sorts of other good things. Um, Dan Henson, second from the right, he is a JavaScript ninja. He works as an intern at Pivotal Labs now. Um, he recently has written a bunch of really awesome features like hover cards, a little drop down for notifications. Right now he is working on uh, revamping the mobile site. Um, but, but just another person who just came out of the internet and to, to help out for this awesome cause. Sarah May, um, she is a senior Ruby on Rails engineer at Pivotal Labs. She um, helped us set up our continuous integration server, which means it's essentially, we write tests, so we say, uh, when, I put, when, I, when I click this button, this should happen. And we do this programmatically, so we know if we break something, we don't have to actually click on the button to check it out. We can just, um, the, our program will just tell us that it's red and we need to fix things, or this particular part of, of the system. So she helped us set up the CI server, um, is also the go-to person when we have really difficult questions. Um, and also she's super into just both community building and open source, she set up or she is one of the couple of people that made Rails Bridge, which is a Ruby on Rails workshop for women who um, help so to, to get people to just to develop more. Um, the, then there's Dennis Schubert and David Morley. So Dennis Schubert and David Morley, they run the second two largest installations. So uh, David Morley is from Seattle. He runs Diasporg and Dan Schubert is from uh, Germany. He runs Jerospora, which is sort of the German diaspora installation, which is the largest one over there. He's uh, sort of, both of them are sort of known locally for, for those things. I think Dan Schubert goes to conferences and speaks about what it means to run diaspora for Germany. So um, also there's Kevin Kleiman um, and Mike Dawson, both of whom, so Mike Dawson, Kevin Kleiman, both of whom triage, um, triage sort of feedback from average users because we have lots of different levels of feedback that we get. So from actual users from the site, we have a, a get satisfaction set up. They also write sort of tutorials for users to, like, to help people know how to use Diaspora. Um, also Praveen, who is over there, he's been doing really awesome work at um, expanding our Diaspora's India community. Um, he's just throwing all sorts of really awesome meetups, um, getting developers to work in on little features. Um, the Android app, for example, there's, there's an initiative there um, that was in large part started by Praveen. Um, also, there's just all sorts of other awesome, awesome featured users. Oh, excellent, excellent. So, so the people up there, some of whom, like, so uh, Mr. Minus, uh, Dark Vader, Cass Edwards, Joel Trust, there's lots of people that make really awesome content on Diaspora, and they are also a part of this larger ecosystem, which is way bigger than anything we could ever build solely by being the four of us in an office.
So, what is diaspora, you might ask? Well, it's, um, it's, it fulfills like a bunch of different needs and therefore it's like sort of hard to categorize into like any one bucket. Um, so we see it as, as three main things. And this is where, what we're gonna talk about for the first duration of our talk. Um, we see it as a social networking platform, first, uh, an online identity provider, and your personal data store where you accrue information about yourself. Um, and when you log in, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is what it looks like. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. So, so, so the first, the first part of this is um, diaspora is a federated social network, and what that means is, and many of us use federated social networks today. Examples of which being, for example, cell phone providers. I'm able to call Dan, who might be on AT&T and I might be on T-Mobile, even though we use different providers, we're still able to communicate with one another. Another example is uh, postal service. I'm able to send letters to France, for example, or, or, or email providers. I don't have to necessarily have a Gmail account, or uh, if a friend of mine has Yahoo, we can still communicate. Um, so this is something we don't have in the social networking space right now, but that's what we're building. Um, Here's, I guess, a diagram, a high-level diagram of what that looks like. Um, the, so, so, so these represent providers. So this is our installation. This is an installation in Seattle. This is an installation in Germany. There's way more than this. This is just for demonstrative purposes. The little asterisks represent the users. Um, and as you can see, Supposing I live right here, I can still communicate with people in Germany and people in Seattle regardless of where they choose to live. This also allows us all sorts of other awesome advantages. For example, I or, or anyone can download the software and potentially just run it at home with, and just join this federation and not have to require permission or anything of that sort in order to join. This is really powerful because it prevents lock-in. So this, as in, if, if one provider becomes sort of a bad actor, people, they, they will start getting bad press and people will not sign up for them. And we're also building sort of tools to migrate once you're already on a provider that's not in place yet, but coming. Um, so, the, so each diaspora installation can have its own agenda, but this doesn't mean that if one installation wants to promote certain parts of things, this doesn't mean the entire ecosystem have to, has to follow that agenda. Um, and right now, so most of us, and this is an example that sort of in part got us started, right now we're sort of, we're stuck on services which we may not necessarily love, but are purely stuck there because our friends are there. And this, I mean, this is true in some part for everybody, but in some, in some respects, this is what made us tick originally and, and, and begin sort of moving into, into this federated space. All right, so that's number one. Number two is we see Diaspora as your online identity provider, right? So um, when you sign up with any Diaspora installation, you're given a Diaspora ID. So you select a username and you'll be username at you know whatever installation you're at very much like an email-like identifier. So I myself am on joindiaspora.com, the installation that we run. So I can go up to people and I could be like, hey, you can find me at daniel at joindiaspora.com. Like, that's how we can talk, right? And it doesn't matter, like, they don't have to be on joindiaspora.com to communicate with me or, like, add me to their friends list, right? Or send me, like, a private message or comment on my stuff, right? Um, so we think that's really powerful and, you know, we're taking it further, as in we're extending this, this diagram here. We added these yellow things right here. And uh, those represent applications within this ecosystem. So the idea is <coughs> you'll give your diaspora ID to applications, right? Uh, a good example right now of like a, like a provider and an application is um, you guys use like, a, do you guys use like a TweetDeck or like Spotify or something, you'll hook up your Facebook or Twitter account to this external application, right? And you'll say like, this is my Facebook ID, hook up with Spotify or whatever, right? So that's what this kind of represents. 
we want to uh, you know encourage this uh, this like you know environment of applications within this federated space which we're going to go into more detail about because it's like actually super tricky once you have once you yeah. have that yeah uh, once you have not only just one provider but you have multiple providers it gets really tricky really quickly but we actually found a solution and it's really awesome but we're going to talk about that a little later so third part diaspora as an online data store so as dan mentioned we in our ecosystem we will have applications and the so right now one could imagine um, applications like a, a photo sharing application that ties in location and a messaging application that also ties in location and and so so you can imagine this guy be the photo plus location app or actually this guy be a photo plus location app and this guy be uh, music plus location app and me as a user right here I use both of them but right now on the on the, on the general internet as a whole I have to recreate my location in both places because I'm just scattered all around the web and and this sucks for me because I'm doing dumb work which doesn't benefit society at all uh, but and, and, and it can totally be fixed so what we're gonna do is we're so this application will write back to back to me everything I create on it, and so will this one. But the direction is not only this way, but it, it also goes up. So so if I already created location on this application, I'm, I will be able to use it in another application that uses location. Um, this allows for all sorts of like better user interfaces, but also less annoyance for me as a user. Um, and and we are sort of, we're, we're building and we've built and we'll continue building infrastructure to make, to make that, that part possible. And we'll, we'll, we'll dive into more details about how we did that. So we believe that like these three factors um, make Diaspora an open ecosystem, right? Um, so we view Diaspora as a rich environment for innovation um, and like the reason why we see this is because there's not going to be like a central dictator, right? And federation like really plays. I think somebody's winning over there. I think they like open ecosystems. Yeah, open ecosystems. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, right. <laughs> what federation gives us is that there's no central <laughs> central dictator, basically. Um, you know, with all user accounts, right? They're scattered all around. So the idea is that anybody can just hop into this ecosystem. They can spin up uh, an installation for like an identity provider or they can make an application and everything just kind of works, right? So so right now, the example is like on, on Twitter, to, to kind of get into the Twitter ecosystem, you have to register an application with Twitter. You have to abide by like, you know, certain rules that they dictate um, and like that's how you get into the Twitter ecosystem right it's like there's like a lot of friction there and there's somebody dictating you know rules that you have to abide by which kind of sucks when you look at something like um, you know take the browser for instance right you guys use Firefox or Chrome you could download whatever the hell you want as an extension right and like you can get it through Google but you can download it anywhere right and it gives you the freedom and it gives developers freedom to make you know uh, pretty interesting extensions and they don't have to go through Google because that's annoying right so that's where we really see diaspora going is like an open ecosystem you know um, sort of embracing this innovation through decentralization so I we I'll talk a little bit more about how open ecosystems are better than closed platforms so first, closed platforms dictate and define capabilities. On the other hand, open platforms, developers can innovate. This sort of uh, uh, a like feature is, is a perfect example of this. Uh, Mr. ZYX just went ahead and wrote the like feature, and now when I post something, other people can like it. And this was sort of, there's no, there's no need to ask necessarily permissions from us. There's um, the and 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 
and but this is this is only a part of that. That's just only one example on which ecosystem can be expanded in terms of capabilities. For example, um, there's all sorts of data types that we don't support yet, but but we will once sort of once there's a use case for them, and once people can extend and we'll expand them as well. Um, second, right now applications have a hard time cooperating on closed platforms. On the other hand, open ecosystems tend to encourage connectedness and sharing. Um, and the example that I mentioned previously, a photo application plus a location application, right now I would have to recreate my location in both places, but that sucks. Um, and right now, at least in the web space, the monolithic platforms usually don't focus on helping applications uh, connect with one another, because it's most of the time it's not in their own best interest. Um, Third, uh, closed platforms usually have large gatekeepers and all sorts of approval processes and all sorts of ways they can tell you, no, you cannot do that. We will cut you off. Um, on the other hand, open ecosystems, uh, they, they, they embrace equality and they embrace, they, it's, uh, or the, the, they minimize the inequality. And you don't have to ask for permission, as I said a thousand times already. Um, but this is definitely in stark contrast with what we have. So this is what our ecosystem looks like right now. We got our first application, Cubbies. And Cubbies is super awesome. It solves a little use case very perfectly, but I'll let Dan talk about it because he is the one that sort of spearheaded that effort. All right, so this is Cubbies. This is like the page you get hit with. I'm not sure. They're actually photos that or behind that, but I guess you the projector's really not bright enough. But you'll see on the next. Yeah. Or anyway, so you know, I built this thing called Cubbies not originally as a diaspora application. Uh, a few months ago, or I guess like two months ago, out of a frustration, and hopefully you guys can share my frustration. Um, you guys know Reddit, right? You guys know Reddit, and you know about Tumblr and all these other great great like dumping grounds for just really stupid images and like <laughs> gifs and like cats and like all this crazy shit that like is like totally awesome right so what do you do you're just like I love that thing I'm gonna drag it to this folder on my computer that I labeled internet folder or like stupid gifs right and you just accrue all this stupid stuff and like you know I've been doing this for ages piles um, of stupid gifs just piles and piles of <laughs> stupid, stupid stuff. Um, so I had a problem. I opened this folder and I was like, wow, there are a thousand GIFs of cats eating pizza in this folder. And like, I can't get them out, right? Like they're trapped in this folder on my computer. Um, so I tried using Dropbox to kind of, you know, have my cats everywhere. But it really like kind of sucked. And like, I didn't have like a nice gallery to like view images. and. It's kind of a pain to like, you know, drag your photo and find the folder and put it in, right? So it sucks. So I made Cubbies, which is basically you sign up and you get a browser extension for Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to, once you have the extension installed, you shift click on any image on any web page on the internet and it saves it into your internet folder and it's on the internet and it's great. And this is what my internet folder looks like. Um, it's infinite scroll, but like it's really cool. Like it just shows you all the photos. It does that one use case like really well, right? It lets me collect really stupid stuff. And if this were like an actual web page and not a screenshot, you'd see that like half these things are gifs. Like totally murders my browser. Um, but it's awesome because like uh, I also like you know responding in comments with just like uh, like you know the WTF face or something, right? And now like, now I can go to my cubbies and I can say like, oh, I could just pull, pull the image, right? And it's always there and they're already on the internet so I don't have to upload them anywhere. So that was good. So that was, that was gravy, right? Um, you know, I had cubbies, had a few people on it, going super well, you know, using it for a few weeks and then I was like, damn, like now I wanna, I wanna like show off all these stupid photos I'm finding. It's all about right? nerd cred. It's like all about nerd cred, <laughs> right? Like, I gotta show everybody this this photo, right? Or like, yeah. 
any of these photos I'd like to share with like a plethora of people. And um, so, you know, I came back to Cubby's a few weeks later after using it, looked at the code again, and I was like, well, shit, like, what do I have to do to do that? Well, I have to build in, like, you gotta follow people, other people on Cubby's, annoying, like, annoying feature that I have to write. I have to put in, like, likes, you know, like, so people can like things and I can get my nerd cred, right? Um, you know, I want people to reshare these things that I found. Uh, and I want people to comment on them and have commentary on how awesome this thing is, right, that I found. Um, so, you know, I kind of stepped back and I was like, okay, I got to do all this stuff. And I was like, wait, working on Diaspora, we just did all that stuff. Why am I going to do that again? It's like, it's going to take a really long time. And like, and I'm going to have to establish connections with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of awesome people who I already met on Diaspora. Uh, totally sucks. So we were just like, hmm, how about we make Cubbies the first diaspora application? How about we tie that into the information, you know, all those connections that we've made on on diaspora, and let's bring let's bring our cat photos to diaspora. Yeah. Let's have our followers comment on them, right? Dem democratization of cat photos. Basically, I mean, like it's really like a really simple, dumb thing, but it got us thinking. We were like, all right, let's like make this an application. So. We don't have to write comments and you know segment another account that I have to worry about, right? That's like dumb, stupid. So, so this is I guess to zoom in to our previous diagram. This is Cubby's. This is Dan with all his nerd cred over there and all his connections. <laughs> and this is the part we didn't have, the connect to diaspora part. Um, and but but we did have we did have the red part. We did have a pod communicating to other pods. So that's what that's what we did. Yay, we did it. Yay, there's a page about it, about how to do it. Um, yeah, that was just a transition slide, but, yes. but <laughs> Dad can talk more about that. So, so <laughs> this, is just, this is just the intro to like, you know, we wanted to build a diaspora application, and now we want to talk about, you know, how I can now have my stupid photos, and now they actually show up in diaspora and now people can comment on them. I think I got eight likes on that guy. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but it's eight great. Likes. It's great. Um, it's totally awesome. People like really, really like it and they seem to get it and um, it's great that we've we've enabled it to we've enabled cubbies to be synced up with any diaspora installation, right? And this is actually kind of unique. Uh, you don't generally generally see an application uh, hook up to multiple providers, you generally see like, oh, it's a Facebook app, right? Or it's a Twitter app, right? Um, there's technical overhead to make Cubbies work with, right? Like I have Cubbies hooked up to my account at joindiaspora.com, but other guys, you know, the guys in Germany go ape shit over this, right? They love it. Um, and Cubbies also connects to that installation just as well, and it's totally fine. And Cubbies doesn't have to register on all these different installations. So we devised this really tricky strategy that we're going to kind of go into. Going to get a little technical, no, I'm just but it's going to be awesome. Yeah, so as, as we've reiterated, best parts of the internet are focused and tiny and solve cat problems in the best <laughs> ways possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, just like with Cubbies, there's no, there's no need to build all this, all this random following, liking, resharing into Cubbies itself. Um, and also, I don't know about you guys, but currently I'm just bored of, of just applications in general on other social networking services, but also just of other social networking services themselves. So we think that these little best tiny little use case apps are how the world will be better because because now Dan doesn't have to think about how he's gonna drag his his cat photo to diaspora. He can focus on on acquiring more cat photos, you know, more efficiency, uh, and, and, and 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 we can expand into into you know like all sorts of other memes later. Yeah, so I, I think. But like, it's just the start. <laughs> like the takeaway from this is like. Um, you know, before the problem was I was saving photos and then I was going to Diaspora, going to the publisher and uploading photos. It was totally breaking my flow. It was like a design flaw, right? Um, 
So now I can actually share photos on Diaspora without even logging into Diaspora, right? I'm just shift-clicking photos. And zero like, thinking. So zero thinking, and uh, Diaspora kind of extends itself you know, through cubbies, which is great. And we kind of really like that idea of keeping, you know, this is just like a little ethos, like keeping Diaspora skinny, like the, uh, the pod skinny, and like generating content through these applications and having them generate content and that's how you really express yourself on diaspora it's kind of because you know we could try to build a monolithic thing like Facebook and build in like we got to build in like questions and and you know I don't know we, all this dumb shit and like but like we rather we rather uh, you know have the experience through smaller applications we think that's yeah. really what's gonna drive it so that's why we were so hot on getting this whole application framework set up yeah so so how do we do it? How do we do it? Okay, so so the, the first thing was to say like, look, we want to create an application framework. Uh, application framework. Let's let's like look at what's already out there. Like, what are what are different implementations of you know securely passing information from a client, you know, an application to a provider, you know. Um, so we looked at a bunch of different protocols and. We stumbled upon OAuth 2. Well, we didn't really stumble upon it. Everybody uses it. So it was kind of just like, duh, we're going to use OAuth 2. Um, <clears throat> so OAuth 2 is better than OAuth 1. It's a protocol. Uh, it mandates SSL, if you guys are familiar with it. So it piggybacks off of SSL. Um, and it solves a lot of problems. And Diaspora already used SSL. So it was great. It seemed like a perfect fit. and. Um, for application developers, like you know, all the big players use OAuth 2 already. So, you know, if you're gonna develop a diaspora application, something like implementing OAuth 2 isn't isn't foreign. Like if you've made a Facebook app or a Twitter app or something that hooks up with your Google contacts, like you know OAuth 2, right? So, OAuth 2, we're gonna break it down into two parts for you guys. Um, one part is user, user authorization, and the second part is developer. Just registra client registration. Yeah, client registration. So, so we'll, we'll break it down. So break it down. Break it down. down. Um, so first, user authorization. So you guys are probably familiar with this. You go to a website like Spotify, and you're like, hey, I want to connect it to my Facebook account. Let me like click through all these flows. Um, and and so you 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 said hit connect with Facebook. It gives you this dialog box. Um, it asks you for permissions. It describes you what the application does. Has a little nice photo and maybe ratings. Um, and and essentially the but the other key part is you don't have to actually give the application your password, which is awesome for security reasons because you don't want to be creating all these rogue accounts, which then you forget about. You want to just be able to cut off. A, an application, or have a list of applications you've authorized that you can look at instead of forgetting about things. So, um, essentially, this is what the flowchart looks like. Supposing, so you hit an application, and if you're signed into Twitter, it says, hey, um, you're signed into Twitter, you can continue. But if you're not, it tells you, hey, go sign up for or go sign into Twitter. That's and, oh, so, so, Hit an application, sign into Twitter. No, go here, hang out. Um, type in your credentials. Supposing you sign in and 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 go to the application. It it lets you continue on the flow. Supposing you don't, it says, oh, you don't authorize this application. Sucks to be that application. Um, then you're like you're like, okay, cool. Um, do you authorize this application? You're like, allow. And if you allow, it, it allows the application, gives it some credentials, and allows the application to post tweets for you, or post to your Facebook wall, read your content, just all of, all of, this, all of this stuff. So, so that's the first part. The user, uh, yeah, so it gives, it gives an application a token, which it can use later, which is pretty cool. Um, first part, breaking it down, part two, client registration. Okay, so if you're a developer, this is what you have to do. You got to go to one of these places and be like, yo, what's my app name and description? And let me upload a photo. And, and what, like, who is the contact information for this application? And like, 
I don't know. So, so lots of, you have to fill this out, and it sucks. And there's just lots of stuff to fill out um, for, different, for different providers. So, the, so in traditional OAuth 2 presumes one client, one provider. So, so this, is, this is your Spotify, and this is your Facebook, or your Twitter, or whatever. Um, and in Diaspora, we have one client, n plus one provider. So, so, so Cubbies connects to Dan with his, all of his nerd cred, and also connects to, uh, I don't know, Dan Shub or somebody. Um, and, and, and the thing about this is that as an application developer in a traditional world, I would have to go and register in all these places. But we like, don't at all have the liberty to do that. Number one, it's annoying for developers. When, when like, I don't want to be filling out a million of those forms. Number two, um, I may not know about a pod that exists in the world. Just that's just the nature of distributed web, which is like an awesome feature of it because anyone can just spin one up. But I may not be aware of of a new pod, and if I'm not aware, there's like it's impossible for me to register at something I don't know about. Um, so so this is this is the the problem that we needed to solve. Registration needs to be in some ways automated. So so the problem is made cubbies and there are like I think there are like 200 separate diaspora installations out there it's impossible for me to go to 200 different applications or 200 installations and register say this is cubbies blah 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 we're like that totally sucks we can do better than that because it's really dumb just filling out forms like it seems like trivial and like you don't really need to do it but um, you know Working with Cubbies, it was uh, Cubbies relies very heavily on browser extensions, and you can kind of make the analogy that take Firefox for instance, right? Firefox has I think 500 million users, and uh, if I make a Firefox extension, I don't have to go to every 500 million, you know, all those guys and say like, hey, I made this new add-on. Can I just like register really quick on your computer so you can use it? It's like, no, totally dumb. So. Um, so we kind of meditated on, uh, you know, this whole analogy between, you know, the the browser and the extension to the uh, diaspora installation and the application, um, and we just said, hey, all browser extensions have is just like three extra things, and it can just, and it's like uh, smart enough to uh, be able to connect and install on any browser. So like, why don't we do that? And that's what we did. And uh, we made a library called Diaspora Client. It's a protocol that we've made. Well, this, this particular library executes a protocol that we've made. Um, it's on GitHub. It's, uh, it's a Ruby gem. You could just throw it in your project. Uh, but please talk to us first before you do that, because it's still really, really young. We also would like to feed, get feedback on the process of throwing it in. Yeah. So what it does is distributed pre-registration. Yeah, mm, which is which is the, the kick-ass part, right? So, high level. Um, there's four steps to distributed pre-registration, and I will just read them. An application uses a key pair to cite a well-defined challenge. Oh, dude, it's here. Um, I can read it down there, too. That's a good call. Um, a dashboard pod fetches the application manifest and the public key for the application. The pod checks the signature for the manifest and the authorization request, and then if the application um, uh, everything checks out, the application gets automatically pre-registered to that pod. Um, so solving solving the clicking through and typing in, uploading photo for the application, writing descriptions and all that stuff. So so yeah, so, um, so it makes Cubbies a little different than like your traditional Facebook application is that uh, it includes just three extra files, that's all you need, right? And it's exactly how Chrome extension, <coughs> excuse me, it's exactly how a Chrome extension works, right? Uh, you give your application, you generate a, a, a key pair, RSA key pair, um, and you generate a, a manifest. And in there, you put in basically all the data you'd fill in on Facebook, like the description, the app icon, the app URL, and all that stuff, right? So it's like you just type it once. You don't have to type it everywhere. Um, very much like a browser extension. So, applications have RSA key pairs. That's the; those were the two, the the first two 
the first two things that Cubbies has. Um, so what this allows is a lot of awesome stuff. Like things just get totally awesome when you're dealing with uh, you know, you know, key pairs, right? We can go on in detail about this, but in short, uh, it allows the application to you know sign. Um, what would you say? To, just like to have an identity. So so yeah. so a key pair is unique, uh, cryptographically unique to an application. So it's sort of very hard for ev anyone else to come in and be like, hey, I'm this application. Um, so so that's that's one part of it. Um, yeah. It also allows us to set up uh, a trust framework built off of since applications have their own identity like users do on Diaspora, we can create a trust network, right? And this is exactly what like Mozilla does with Firefox add-ons, right? They have extensions and they have their keys and they they say like, okay, this key tied to this app is legit. So it's like totally fine, right? So, uh, and you can only do that when you have the public private key pair uh, because the application can actually produce content that can be verified that it is actually coming from yeah. that application. So, so just to bounce off that as well, so in the future we'll build a sort of a privacy friendly web of trust for these applications. So a, as, as Dan was saying earlier, just because an ecosystem is open doesn't mean there won't be sort of little private verified sectors of it because the, the main point is like anyone should be able to join. So in part what we'll do is we'll, we'll have an incentive for an app to be verified and to like respect users and not sell their data to to third parties or things of that nature. But but this is allowed because we have sort of key pairs. Yeah, and in most cases, having this uh, trust framework prevents man-in-the-middle attacks, which is you never want those. Those are pretty bad. Um, okay, and. Applications also have manifest files, like if you've ever made a Chrome extension or a Firefox extension, this is what you do, right? You fill out, you know, I've said this before, it's just like name, icon, URL, description, and like what the hell this application is going to do with your data, right? Like it, it it's going to like, uh, it's going to ask, like say like, um, in the manifest for Cubbies, it says like, I want right access to your photos. And that's presented to the user in a very friendly manner so the user can intelligently yeah. make a choice. There, there will also be descriptions for all of those things. So, so it would be like, I want right access to your photos because I want to do this and this. So we'll sort of keep applications honest about what they're doing. Yeah, we want to be very honest about how applications are using your data. Um, you know, we can bounce off a trust framework to kind of leverage that. But, um, you know, a lot of diaspora is about transparency, about like what the hell is going on with your data. So the manifest is actually like super important, and uh, you know, we're we've looked at like privacy icons and stuff like that. Like, uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff being worked on in this space just to to you know communicate with the end user like what's going on because we all want to know what's going on with our data, right? Is it going to be sold to third parties? Not in cubbies, but um, that's always good to know. Yeah. So so this is this is what uh. A little bit technical. Don't get scared. Um, we had a this, disclaimer. This is this is what this is what a, a manifest looks like for a developer. They just fill out app URL, uh, name, description, all of these things. Hello, hello. They fill out all sorts of cool shit, um, and and then it gets magically turned into this thing called a JJOT. and essentially all that is is a a a way to encapsulate it so just they, they, they squish it all together and then and then they 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 just encode it which is essentially just like turn it into like translated from English to Spanish or uh, so so I can't read it as a human but a computer can read it and and then well, that people can read Spanish that's true that's true um, it encrypts it. It, well, it encrypts it. Well, it encodes it. It, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fully encrypt it. it. But, but moral of the story is, I can't read it. Uh, and, but, 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 but a computer can, and, they're, and a computer is able to sort of act on it. So, um, so yeah, so, so in there, in, in over there, in, there's a public key field. I can, I can, or Dan can point to it. Which means that, that that's the part of the identity that the applications have. 
Um, so, so they're able to establish, I am definitively this application at this URL, and this is how I can prove it to you. Um, so that's, that's, that's part one, manifest. All right, getting more technical. More technical. Um, application, sign a well-defined challenge. This I can explain simply also, or I'll, or I'll do my best. Um, so there's, there's, three, there's four parts that you want to sign as an application. When I cubbies want to authenticate to a diaspora, for example, it says, hey, I am an application at application.app, as in the example. Um, I want to register at pod.pod, .pod, as in the example. Um, this is the, the timestamp. This is the Unix timestamp. So this is like the time when I'm registering. And this is just, and, and the last part is like a random, a random string just so, 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 so the time is in there to prevent people from saying, oh, I've, uh, the, the, from someone else coming in and copying it, the, what, what the app sends over, and then, and then saying like, oh, this is an authorization request from this app to this time. We sort of, we only allow the last five minutes to be, to, be, uh, we, we check we check on time that it's within the last five minutes so it's not someone from ten years ago trying to reauthorize yeah so that that uh, just about in that prevents replay attacks so if somebody snatches up this getting sent over like that third party can't just basically replay what was, was yeah set. totally so technical terms technical terms technical terms technical terms yeah replay attack that so yeah so that plus the nonce no replay attacks Yay, no replay attack. Attacks are bad. Yay. Or, no, bad. Boo. 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 Yeah, we need to, they stop playing. There's no, there's no, there's no more cheer for random things. Um, so, so this is, this is what the workflow looks like. Um, so, a user up there, a user provides a diaspora ID to an application. I go to Cubbies and I'm like, yo, I'm Ilya, join diaspora, check it out. Um, so, the, the application is like, hey, did I see join diaspora before or no? If, if the answer is yes, you, you pass go and then you collect your $200. If the answer is no, you, the application automatically, this, the user doesn't see any of this, goes to um, the, si signs the authorization challenge, which we saw here, or which we saw here. So it, it constructs this thing, signs it, shoots it over. Yeah, point, point. Yeah, yeah. I will, I will look at you guys. So, um, yeah. So we're, we're right here. there. We're right there. The that's what I cubbies send over to to pods. I'm like, hey, check this out. I'm trying to authorize you guys. Hope you let me do it. Um, <laughs> and and then the pods like, okay, cool. Let me check you out. Uh, and 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 it's like, hey, like, what, let me go to this manifest URL. So it's like cubbies.com/manifest.json. And, and that's what, that's what the, the manifest field. This is what they get. And they're like, hey, cool. I see a public key in there. Let me verify that what you signed on this slide verifies with the, with the public key. So supposing it does, we, yeah, we, hit, around, we hit yes. And then, and then we, go, we go forth and prosper. And if it does not, it returns. This is, the user doesn't see any of this, but it returns a, a well-defined error to the application saying, like, here are the reasons why it didn't work out. Uh, make sure your clocks are synchronized. Um, um, just all sorts of things that the that user does doesn't see. That does happen, yeah. It does. It does happen. Um, so, so this is, I guess, step one. Application checks if it's already registered. If yes, hangs out. Um, if no, does stuff. Uh, so that's, I, yeah, OK. Uh, and and once, once, once the app is authorized, once we pass Go and perform okay, school and to Flow, so you, you want to? Yes. Can you go back? So this, this guy? This guy. This guy. Yeah, so this, um, <laughs> we just like threw a lot of stuff at you, so I'm sorry. Wait, uh, wait, wait. But we have a limited amount of time. That's true. But, uh, so like this is all uh, just like prereq stuff to just performing just your basic OAuth 2 flow that everybody yeah. who develops an app knows. So, so this at, is just at like the end, at the uh, perform OAuth 2 flow, you go to there. Here. Got yeah. it. This guy. This guy. You hit another flow chart and you do this. Yeah. So so lots of flow charts hanging out. Um, but this is OAuth 2, this and what we've everyone done. Everyone knows how to do yeah. this. So yeah. 
every every developer that developed on most right platforms. so we invented the other we in, awesome yeah. flowchart awesome <laughs> this flowchart this guy creative it's commons it's license <laughs> yeah yeah um, but uh in all seriousness it's like this is like s this this makes like applications perform oauth 2 in a federated system possible and it's awesome uh it really is and it's like Pretty eloquent, like no one's done it before. Nobody's in, done it in before. the web space. And People's uh, done it in lots of yeah. yeah. And um, you know, we wrote a library for it, and it's like really not a lot of code, which is also really awesome. Like I was actually, you know, we were like, oh yeah, let's just like do what browsers do, and I was like, oh my god, this is gonna be like ten bajillion lines of code and like low all level this stuff. That's hard. Stuff. But it's like really wah, simple, wah, wah. yeah. So we came <laughs> up with a pretty eloquent <laughs> solution, at least we thought. So. so so yeah, so once 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 you pass go and once you're authorized, this is this is what cubbies can send to to diaspora. This is essentially all that is, don't get scared, that is what a photo looks like to a diaspora pod. It it has a, a URL yeah. uh, of the person, it has the username of the person, it has when it was published. Um, it has the fact that it's a photo, like where it came from, uh, like where it is on cubbies. Like where's the image lip? How big it is? And um, yeah, and what's what's awesome about this is that like Cubby sends this to your diaspora installation, so um, your diaspora installation can now save this data back to your data store. So now when I use Cubby's, I start accruing that data on diaspora. So Cubby's can, you know, blow up like the server could just blow up, right? It probably wouldn't, but it yeah. could, and like the database can be gone forever, right? But the awesome thing is, like, I'm not I'm, it. I'm not relying on cubbies. So, like, if the next awesome photo sharing, you know, site comes out, I can just start using that, and I still have all of my all stupid of cat cred. photos. <laughs> yeah. Saved, saving nerd cred everywhere. So <laughs> yeah. So the takeaway here is like this. This touches on our, our third point as diaspora as the data store, where you're not even tied to an application. You can just, you know, you create content, and you're just going on your way, and you're just finding the most like innovative and crazy app you want right like it's uh it's all about that and you don't have to worry about recreating any data because it's already saved back to your diaspora installation yeah totally and you can awesome. go where you trust that's the other key thing is that like there's no lock in yeah go do whatever makes you happy uh <laughs> yeah oh and worth noting this is sent this data is sent uh uh, via like OAuth2 protocols, where like OAuth2 gives you uh, a secret token, and uh, you send a token, which is a bunch of gibberish, along with this information, and that basically verifies you uh, to the diaspora installation, which is cool. Yeah. Um, so, why did we even bother with this? Right? It seems like a lot of work. Um, it was a lot of work. Uh, even though the outcome was super simple. Um, but it's because, you know, just to reiterate on the fact that, like, we think federation is key in the social space because it allows for, you know, open innovation, competition, and, uh, you more know. More awesomeness. More awesomeness, yeah. So, like. More cats I everywhere. I mean, like, because, like, really, like, we could have we could have just said, like, oh, we want applications, so. Uh, let's just not allow anybody to spin up diaspora installations, right? That no, sucks. that doesn't make sense. Sucks. So that's why we made diaspora client because uh, we thought it was very important to to have these applications, and we think like a lot of cool stuff is going to come out of just driving experience through applications. We're very big on that. Yeah, uh, it's all about the 3 a.m. when you're like too caffeinated, when you just like want to work on like a little thing and make and solve a perfect use case like Cubbies did. Yeah, like that is allowed by the fact that you can just enter, and once you make it, there's no one there to take it away. That's yeah. the other sort of key part. Which is to great. This entire ecosystem. So it's more more of just like making a website that can hook up to an identity server, and there's there's no like, you know, garbage where you have to like sign up on some provider. It's just a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. No garbage. Like, we need, we need, there's like five. Yeah. Tag lines that came out of the stock. There's like no garbage, cats everywhere. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's cool. Um, so, I guess I do have an analogy here that I wrote down, where it's like here's here's the example. Why federation is awesome. 
in you know this whole application space, right? Say I love Farmville. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but if I did, right, like I would need a Facebook account to use Farmville and hook up with my friends, right? Um, and that kind of sucks for me as a user. Like I am required to sign up with a single provider to uh, you know fulfill my urge to plant crops and buy cows. So that doesn't really make sense, right? Like we think it would be cool if you could just sign up with like Twitter and use Farmville, or you know that's like the analogy I guess that I can make. Like uh, you know to use an application, you shouldn't be like. Uh, you know, forced. told, forced to use any one single provider, and that's what Federation gives you. It's an equal playing field, which is great, and that's like why we bothered with it. So, I guess this is, yeah, <coughs> okay. So after we hooked this up, uh, this is just like a pretty cool side note. Um, I had this like epiphany of like why diaspora was so awesome. Like, I think it's like. That's like one of like the many, one of the many reasons, like one of, one of the many times when I had an epiphany about, oh, why diaspora makes sense, right? So like on diaspora, I have about like, like 500 followers or something like that. Not to toot my own horn, but um, I have a lot of people. <laughs> great. The 500 followers, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're all I'm over there. No, but what's great is, so I'm on Diaspora, on joindiaspora.com, I have 500 followers, and they're across 20 different installations, right? So, so 500 followers, 20 different installations of Diaspora. Did, did he mention there's 500? It's 500, <laughs> <Just kidding>. crazy. <laughs> and they're all on 20 different installations because they chose, <laughs> because they, they elected to, to sign up with providers because they chose to, right? Um, so what's crazy now is like I hook up cubbies to diaspora and within like a minute, I'd say a minute's fine, like I shift click a photo and that photo gets posted to cubbies, gets shot to my diaspora installation and then diaspora X is basically the social router, which is crazy, and it shoots it out to 20 different installations and it's just me shift clicking a photo. And distributed. it's like distributed. It's like a really weird thing to think about because usually with an application, you just click something and it just goes to one place. But you know, like Diaspora gets the photo and the photo and uh, Diaspora goes, oh, you have 500 followers. You're totally awesome. So I'm going to send <laughs> this photo to 20 different servers. <laughs> all and all it's crazy. But like the thing is like as an app developer, that's super powerful. I can just tap into this like this like social routing layer. It's like just like think about it it's like crazy um but uh yeah it's just like because we, we built all this infrastructure and like now like an application like app developer doesn't even have to worry about where all your friends are right they just have to worry about connecting with you and it's super simple so that's why it's pretty cool so, uh, so next steps. yeah next steps where are we headed with all of this what is what is the bright future look like so there's there's a couple of things there's dasper client and the unified JSON API, or Diaspora, Diaspora Connect, Diaspora Client. Um, so first step, Diaspora Connect. We want to turn that into that. <laughs> I wish I wish I had like a like a button to press and be like, yeah. Uh, so so and and because because right now Cubbies does not have Diaspora Connect, but it will. It will in the near future. And but this this is awesome for many other reasons that we've reiterated. I don't have to give Cubby as my password to the entirety of the universe because well, no one remembers more than one password. Let's be honest with each other. No, no, no. But with Diaspora Connect, with Cubbies, you have to actually sign up for a new account. You have to sign up for a Cubbies account, and then you just you know go into settings and say hook it up with Diaspora, right? But that's dumb, right? We want your Diaspora ID to be your one. ID, right? So instead of having to sign up for Cubbies, which is kind of lame, and it's large in part because it didn't start out as a diaspora app, you know, the idea is you'd go to Cubbies, like your friend would tell you about how awesome it is, and you'd go there and you say, oh, I have a diaspora ID. You just type in your diaspora ID and click connect, and you don't have to worry about another password. It's very similar to, you know, connect with Facebook, how like you don't need to remember yeah. 
more... No passwords. Yeah. No, no passwords. passwords. Only tokens, because no one remembers more than one password. Yeah. And I mean, it's, wait, wait, it's actually, like, poll, quick poll. How many people have one password which they use in most places? A lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like, it sucks. Guilty. <laughs> but, like, that's super insecure, right? So, like, if somebody gets your password, then you're basically screwed. Yeah. But, like, um, you know, if we lock it down to one place where you own, um, you don't have to be spreading your password on all, like, sprinkling it on all these different databases, yeah. setting up different uh, So, so, so this, is, this is the case where centralization is awesome. So we don't want to be distributing passwords everywhere. Yeah. We want to centralize it around you. Center, yeah, around the user. Okay. So bop bop. That. And uh, you know, um, I don't know if you guys are fans of XML or JSON, um, or if you even know or what don't that care. is. Um, <laughs> but uh, right now, like we have this technical stuff spilled out in our appendix. Um, but right now we use XML, which is uh, just a markup format, to transmit data between different diaspora installations. Um, and now we're starting to use JSON with applications to diaspora installations. So, so the yellow lines in, in this photo, this photo, yeah. so the, the yellow lines is JSON. It's one markup format. That's one markup format. And these are XML. These which are is different. Another, another we need to format. color them the same color. Basically, yeah. So it's just uh, that's more of a just making it easier for people who want to develop for diaspora, whether it be applications or just the core, uh, you know, federation protocols or whatever. We want to make uh, we want to bundle all this information passing up into one one happy family and use one standard. Um, that and standard is drum roll, please. And it's activity, activity streams. streams. Yeah. Um, this is like, so, activity streams, right? Is awesome. It's great. Uh, <laughs> they love it. It's um. Kids love it. It's basically <laughs> it's it's basically the product of like a bunch of smart people getting into one room or one mailing list and just hammering out. A super extensive protocol, which we don't want to like replicate, right? Yeah. Like this took them a very long time to make, don't and uh, it like it covers basically every single use case of message passing you can imagine. So, 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 for example, this contains all the likes, the, the photos, the all the social objects, is yeah. is marked up. So, like you can basically represent any user action or like anything in this markup called activity streams. We're using it for applications to talk to di diaspora installations right now. We want diaspora installations to talk to diaspora installations using the same markup. Um, it's kind of a chore, but we think it'll be it'll it'll be easier for people to grasp. Like, there isn't really a difference. Skeletons in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> so, you got us. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's like we just wanted to throw that out there, just in case anybody wants to contribute code. Because <laughs> um, we are open source. Um, so, you know, the Diaspora project is super ambitious, but it is super achievable. Totally achievable. Totally achievable. It's like out there in the wild, it's working, people seem to really like it, and we're getting more and more of a community around it. It really is a group effort. Like, you know, when people say, like, oh, like, who's, who's the guys who work on Diaspora? I'm just like, well, it's like a couple hundred people, right? Like, yeah. It's not like just the four of us. Um, Speaking of which, actually, we're gonna do a meetup tomorrow at one o'clock, which we'll tweet about a little bit in a little bit once we find a venue. Um, so if you wanna join forces and become part of the Mexico City slash Mexico's diaspora community, you guys should show up, and the link will be posted on our Twitter <laughs> tomorrow, one o'clock. Yeah, excited. somewhere um, around here probably. So again, those guys. <laughs> You know, we see diaspora as a transparent layer between you and like expression with these applications and consuming and uh, you know connecting with people. And yeah, we just think it's a really cool project. Like, thank like we you know thanks for showing up and sitting through our gruelingly technical talk. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of technical, it was, and I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming out. Um, and yeah. You guys probably have questions. That's what this slide's for. Questions or also 
we can also talk about the red lines, but that's sort of technical. We can leave that till tomorrow also. Yeah. If, we do if have, people are interested. Yeah. Uh, we do have a, a super big appendix where we can tell you, we can go into depth on how diaspora installations talk to each other uh, if you're really into that. But yeah. you guys might have questions. Yeah. All right, all right, questions, questions. Let's, let's steal your mic, then I will unmic myself and we can share. Hello, testing. It's Huddle. Huddle. Hi there. Hello. I've got a question. Um, I am not a programmer, I'm an end user, but I would also like to contribute to the project because it is very ambitious and I think most of us have been looking forward to it since it was first forced in Kickstarter. So I would like to know what can I do to contribute you know, to the project. So Dan, Dan actually talked about this very point in France before, so I'll let Dan take this one. Show yeah. Tomorrow. Um, I actually, it's funny because I gave a talk about uh, entitled Diaspora Open Source for Non-Geeks in Paris a month before. So there you go. Um, kind of really different from this talk. Um, but I had this, God, I had this slide um, about, um, you know, I... I'm going to find this slide. I can, I can blabber on for a little bit. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Thank you. Um, no, but there's, there's lots of, so there's, there's several fronts. There's, so, so coding is one front. Uh, just user interface and just feedback on that front is, is phenomenal because, and, and being sort of vocal about it. Uh, there you go. Not all just codes. This is from uh, a talk that I gave with uh, Rafi uh, in Paris. And this was our takeaway from that talk that, um, you know, there's this, this whole thing about like, you know, open source is cool and you have to know how to program to contribute to open source. And but you don't. But, but you don't. It's like, a, it's like a fallacy and it kind of sucks that like, that's like the impression that people get. So um, together let's break that, 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 that mold. Well, anyway, uh, you know, I kind of had a few bullet points. I went on like on a tangent on this slide, but um, you know, even like even just using a product as an end user, even just using open source software, like you're gonna find a bug. Like no software is perfect, and like you know that's a red flag to somebody who wants to contribute and help and like wants to get involved. Like people who want to get involved usually look for like bugs to pick off. So if you're an end user just using the product and finding bugs like that's just like super helpful that is like I would consider that contributing to open source submit feedback also yeah so like submitting feedback like you don't really know how to you don't really need to know how to code to submit feedback to say like look this right here is a total design failure and it's impossible for me to do what I want right here right just like providing that feedback super helpful because the thing is like you know speaking personally like um, like I flip flop between like design diaspora and coding, um, so it's very hard to like put myself into like a user's shoes, right? So feedback is like the most valuable thing, right? Like we have a get satisfaction uh, in like message boards where people are just like, "Hey, I really like this feature. Like keep on working on that," and that's that's helpful. So like we know we code more on that thing, right? Or this thing sucks, or you know, and then we know to solve that, right? Like there are a lot of people who like, a perfect example is like the ability to reshare uh, a post on Diaspora that was just put in yesterday actually. But it was because a bunch of non-coders were just like. They were making gifts. Yeah, they were making gifts saying like, where the hell is reshare? And like, I'm not sure if you guys have seen like the panda commercials, the angry, the angry panda. <laughs> but like, it would just like. Um, Can we find it? You can find it. I can, I'll, I'll find it. Well, I'm talking, but like, there were there was like a group of people. Hmm? There, there were a group of people who, um, you know, voiced their opinions, and that was super helpful, and that got a feature pushed out, right? And it makes diaspora better, uh, and more attractive for people to use. Oh, I need. Oh, internet. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You are you are amazing. Uh, diaspora. I'll pull it up. Okay. okay. But yeah, like like that, or like if you. Like we have people now just doing mock-ups. Yeah. They're just like, mock they just like use like the GIMP or something, and they just like move things around the, on the page, and they're just like, I want to see this, and that's helpful too. Or like if you're like design savvy or something, like, okay. 
I don't want to blabber on, like, because like I'm like staring you down right now. <laughs> but, I'm, like, yeah. but I like I hope I answered your question. If you have like any other questions. No, it's perfect. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank perfect. you. This is it. This is okay. it. Hold on.